All right, so my name is Bert Beckwith. I work for SpringSource. I'm on the Grails team. Um, I've done a lot of work with um, plugins in Grails. Um, and specifically, one of the more popular sets of plugins that I worked on are the Spring Security plugins. This isn't a Spring Security talk. This is um, something that I sort of realized that I had been very much focused on URL security and blocking access to certain parts of your application, but less focused on um, the more general case of security, like cross-site scripting and SQL injection and th things like that. So um, I wanted to, to learn for myself and also to share with the community information about how to really have a, a very holistic uh, approach to securing your, your Grails application, not just URLs, but the, the whole application. Um, so, blah, blah, blah. All right, so a lot of what I will be talking about is based on uh, information that the, um, I, I don't know how to pronounce this, I, I say, in my head I say OASP. Um, it's an organization that publishes a list every three years of the top 10 most um, severe security risks for web applications. And the list changes every year Primarily because um, the severity of each topic tends to be pretty much the same, but um, a, an item can drop further down in the list once it becomes less prevalent. Um, so for example, um, URL-based URL security is I think number six currently, because although if you allow access to a section of your site that you shouldn't allow access to, that's a potentially severe problem. Um, it's an easy one to, to implement. It's easy to, to, to do that. So it's, it's lower, lower on the list. Um, so um, it's a very big organization. They have a lot of sub-projects. They, they publish a, a, uh, a uh, library called Anti-SAMI. They also have their ESAPI. Um, and they have testing tools like Web Scarab. Um, and they also do these um, code review uh, cheat sheets. It's, it's a wiki. And I, I saw um, very recently that they have a, th there's not much information there yet, but someone has started a Grails um, security sort of checklist that you can go through. Um, so hopefully at some point that will be more fleshed out and that'll have a lot of useful information that's very Grails specific. Um, so the first, the most severe, currently this year's um, most severe risk is injection risks. So the, the big one there is SQL injection. That's, that's the, the big risk. Um, so if you concatenate um, SQL parts together into a string without escaping the, um, the data that's supplied to you from the users, you open yourself up to a, to a uh, SQL injection risk. Um, luckily, you tend not to do that much in Grails because you would use a dynamic finder, you would use criteria queries, you would probably even use HQL. Although if you c dynamically build the HQL string, you can give yourself a SQL injection risk there. Um, this is sort of the classic um, XKCD comic about um, what not to do. So you can do things like this, right? So if a user um, uh, tries to log in and they type in their username, that's fine. They're, they're a, a good user. But a hacker user can type in, it's a little hard to see because of the quotes, but I mean you can basically see what's going on here that by using an or, e either side can be true. One equals one is always true in, in, in SQL. So this will return every user from the, user, from the database. So if you have naive code, a couple things will happen. One, this will be very slow, so this is also sort of a a performance attack, um, but also you'll get a lot of records and if your code is very silly and it just takes the first result because it assumes that you would only either have zero or one results, then you can log in without a password for the first user that comes up. And if you are a little smarter about how you create this, this SQL, you could probably uh, log in as the first admin that, that comes up. Um, so that's a query, but you can also do, um, you can also do, if you're doing updates, you can also get it to, to do really uh, disastrous things on, on your updates. And if, if you would allow something like this, then they could actually damage your database, drop your database, drop a table, um, truncate all the rows in it. Um, 
and then hopefully you've got a good backup strategy and you can go back to uh, 12 hours ago worth of data. Um, so the obvious fix is in real SQL, regular SQL, is to use a prepared statement, right? So instead of concatenating in the actual values, you use a question mark placeholder, and then you let the, um, you call set string, set int, set <coughs> object, whatever. There's a bunch of methods you can call on the prepared statement class to let the driver escape that appropriately. So you don't deal with quotes and single quotes, double quotes, any of that stuff. You just, um, and this is not, this may fail with an exception, but it won't, it cannot open you up to a SQL injection risk. So HQL has that same problem though, because you can do the same thing. It's, HQL is not SQL, but it looks about the same. But you can concatenate strings together, but you shouldn't. You should use question mark placeholders uh, for your HQL. So in general, uh, Grails queries tend to be, I think in order of preference, dynamic finders, and then um, probably criteria queries. The where queries, the new ones in 2.0 are really nice, I think. I think they're a lot more intuitive to me anyway than, than criteria queries. And all of those are backed under the hood by criteria queries. So uh, dynamic finders and where queries get turned into criteria queries. And criteria queries in uh, Hibernate always use pre prepared statement. So you don't have to worry about SQL injection for any of those query types. Um, the only time you have to worry about it in Grails is when you're doing dynamic HQL um, or, of course, SQL. Um, so. so the big takeaway here, and this is really for every, every one of these topics, is you, you can't trust your users. Um, unless you have the luxury of having an internet application where you've got maybe, you know, you know every person who uses your application, that's very rare. And even then, if it's someone like me, I may mess with your app just for fun, right? <laughs> so if you have anyone who's, who's at all evil or just creative, um, you, you just can't trust your users. Um, so uh, let me mention just quickly also that SQL injection is the big injection risk, but there's also um, uh, command injection. So, you know, in Groovy, one of the, the, the really fun demos to do uh, when you're teaching Groovy or when you're showing Groovy off to someone is how you can take a string and you can call the execute method on it. So you can get a directory listing, you can say ls-l dot execute, right? And that'll just run that with a, it'll. Um, so if you allow a user to pr uh, provide any information that's included inside of an executable string like that, um, you open up uh, a real risk to a, uh, to command, to command injection, and they could delete directories, they could do all sorts of damage. So um, anytime you accept user input and you use it to execute anything, a query or a command, you have to um, escape it somehow um, or clean it. All right, so uh, cross-site scripting. That, that is number two. Um, so this is the same sort of a thing where you are allowing user input and you, if you don't appropriately escape it or clean it or process it somehow, um, bad things can happen. So, um, and this is cons uh, one of the phrases that they use to describe cross-site scripting is that it's it's a it's like an it's like a injection attack. So it's they call it script injection. Um, so um, one sort of common use case is you have a query, a search, right? like a Google search. And what you're gonna to tend to do is you'll have a search box and they can type whatever they want and then you'll show them you searched for this string and here's your results. Um, so if you don't escape that and they do something, this is a very, very, very simple example, um, but it, this will actually pop up that JavaScript pop-up in your search results. So this is silly. This doesn't hurt anything, this doesn't break anything. But you can use this technique in things like um, comments, or if you allow editable wikis, or things like that. So if you have discuss discussion threads, and you don't escape um, what the users are, are using for their comments, then they can inject uh, JavaScript into the page. And y you guys know how powerful JavaScript is. I mean, we've seen event stuff, and we've seen some really powerful JavaScript just this week. Um, so you can do AJAX calls, you can inspect cookies, you can, if, if you allow that, 
um, you can do some really, really powerful and dangerous things uh, with JavaScript. And if you allow your users to write script into your pages, then bad things can happen. Um, so, yeah. You can bypass security, you can, um, you can do gets and posts, right? You can, you can inject Ajax. Um, so, and this can be used further in uh, CSRF attacks, which I'll talk about in a couple minutes. Um, so, how do, I, how do we avoid this? So, the first thing you want to do when you create a Grails application, well, one of the first things you want to do is convert your codec from the no codec to HTML. You guys aware of this configuration in config.ruby? So if you, if you just say Grails create app, whatever, and then you open up the config.ruby, it'll say Grails views default codec equals none. There's no default codec. So what that means is anytime you say, uh, inside of a GSP, you say dollar sign, brace, and some expression, that is not escaped at all. So anything that the user types and you redisplay will get displayed exactly the way they typed it. What we should be doing is HTML encoding everything so that we turn um, less than signs into ampersand LT semicolon and, and uh, so we, we escape out that JavaScript. The reason we don't do that in Grails, and we will at some point, is that we were concerned that if, um, we, we know that there are plugins that um, explicitly encode um, output. And so if we automatically um, turn the HTML codec on, we're gonna double encode. So we need to make sure that the plugins get fixed. So we're gonna have a, 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 a a period at some point where we're going to announce that you know we're going to switch to the HTML encoding by default. Fix your plugins. Fix your applications. Um, so the the good thing about this is that double encoding is better than no encoding because you can fix that, right? You can fix the plugin. You can fix your code. Um, but if we have no encoding at all, then you open yourself to, up to these risks. So you can do this right now. Change your your codec to uh, to use HTML encoding. Um, and if you find a, a bug in your code where you're already encoding it, or you have a plugin that encodes anything uh, right there, then fix the plugin or uh, fix your code. And be really careful with this sort of syntax. When you use percent equals in a GSP, that writes whatever this expression uh, resolves to to the output stream directly. This will never get encoded, no matter what setting you use in Grails, because this is the way that you know, Grails allows you to just send anything to the client. Um, if, if you know that this is safe, that this is not user input, then of course do that. But if, you, if you're uh, trusting, if you're sending stuff that a user gave to you back to them, back to another user, uh, be very, very careful. Um, one of the risks that I was talking about that you, was that you can have JavaScript code injected into a page where you could read your cookies. You could read the session ID cookie and then you could send that using a JavaScript get or post off to a server and then my server can read your cookie and I can log in as you if we're logged in at the same time. If you set the H HTTP only flag on the cookies, then you cannot script your cookies in JavaScript. That gets, that gets blocked. Um, that's currently only doable um, conveniently if you're using Servlet 3.0. You can do it by creating your own cookies manually, but that's kind of a hassle. But you can set the headers yourself. Um, but when you create a cookie in, uh, in Servlet 3.0, there's actually a method called set HTTP only. You can say true, uh, and it'll set that. So this is actually not something that's in the spec, the cookie spec. It's a, it's a convention. So the browsers all support this, um, but it's not something that, that's actually uh, part of the spec. Another thing that'll help a lot is SSL. So um, if you are, um, in general, I mean, SSL is always going to make your application more secure. If you're not allowing um, just anyone to, to, to intercept stuff, um, if cookies have to be sent over SSL, then they can't be read by, by, the, by the client. Um, using SSL is going to slow your application down very slightly, but it's, it's always going to make you uh, safer. And then, of course, there are libraries that you can use to, um, to do a lot of this work for you. And I'll talk a little bit more detail about what anti-SAMI, ASAPI, and NHDIV are uh, a little later. So the third one 
is broken authentication and session management. So this one's easy to fix. Just don't do bad things. Don't do dumb things. Um, so use a security implementation. Um, authenticate in a sensible way. So um, I would I would not argue that you should only use Spring Security just because I wrote those plugins. But of course you should only use Spring Security. <laughs> but um, but no, use Shiro. I mean, um, Shiro's great, right? Um, in fact, I just recently uh, released a plugin. I don't know if you guys saw it, but it allows you, it's sort of a bridge between Shiro and Spring Security, sort of a Frankenstein plugin. Um, so um, it allows you to use uh, Shiro ACLs inside of a, a, a in, with Spring Security. Because I think, I think Shiro's really nice. It's just that I understand Spring Security well. Um, but you know, use some proven established, battle-hardened security implementation, right? Use something that's been broken and fixed. They've you know, used it in banks and, you know, in major applications that have been, you know, tested and they found the vulnerabilities and they patched them. Uh, whether it's something that's commercial or, or free. Um, but don't write your own security implementation. Use the best um, encryption you can use or, or hashing you can use. Use bcrypt. Um, again, use SSL. Um, another thing that you can do that will help a lot is um, session fix fixation protection. This is, an, is, this is an interesting thing. So if I log into an application, right, or not even log in, not even authenticate, I just, I don't even, maybe I don't even have an account, right? But I can get my, my J session ID because it's in the URL because we haven't disabled it. And I send you a link somewhere by email. And you click it, and my session is still active. By reusing, you, the, you'll reuse that J session ID, and then you, you and I will have the same session. So I'll see everything that you do, and then when you authenticate, now I'm logged in as you, and I can do stuff as you. This is bad. So um, a quick fix for that is to disable URL rewriting. That's by default. That's done in Grails too. Um, you can, if you're using an older version of Grails, or if you've enabled this, then you want to uh, undo that. You want to fix that. Um, and then, as an extra precaution, using session fixation prevention in Spring Security, and I'm assuming Shiro has something like this, and it's a, a common thing. What what happens there is when when you authenticate, it creates a new session and it copies your old session variables into the new session. So. You and I can share that session while, while I'm not authenticated, but then I'm not really going to do anything, right? I'm just going to maybe put some stuff in my shopping cart, and I don't care if you see what, what's in my shopping cart. But as long as once I authenticate, you can't then buy stuff using my credit card, then, uh, then that's fine. Um, so you can see that I, I've bought some uh, ladies' underwear, but you can't um, see that I've actually purchased it. Um, so the big takeaway is don't, um, don't roll your own security. One of, the, one of the things that I really hate about Grail's um, tutorials and demos is um, a lot of times when we talk about creating a Grail's filter, um, that filters intercept requests, right? So this is the before, after, and after view. And one of the easiest, there, there's two really quick um, and easy things to use as examples, logging and authentication. And I, I really, it really bothers me when I see authentication used as the example for uh, how to, what to use filters for because it, those t tutorials encourage you to create your own security implementation and it's pretty unlikely that you're going to do a good job at it, right? I mean, it, it's a hard problem. The, the easy problems are easy, but the hard stuff is hard and I mean, that's easy to say, but I mean, you, you know what I mean. Um, so resist the urge to create your own security implementation. Spring Security and Shiro are very easy to use. There's a lot of tutorials out there, a lot of documentation, a lot of uh, screencasts, a lot of information. Um, all right. Insecure direct object re references. So if we have code in, in our, an application that generates HTML that looks like this, right? So this would be for a user who's authenticated and it's uh, some sort of an e-commerce e application where you can purchase things. And I'm going to show you a list um, of all of all of your uh, purchases for sp specific uh, credit cards, right? So in this case, I've got two credit cards registered. So I log in and I view a sort view the source of the code because I'm a 
smart guy, I'm looking for ways to hack into the system. And I see that you're just putting card view 42 and card view 541302. So the first thing I'm going to do, that, and that's just a GET request, first thing I'm going to do is go card view 43. I'm going to see what I can see there. And then I'm going to see your credit card. And then I'm going to go card view 44 and I'm going to see yours. And then I'm going to write a script that's going to go from one to a billion and download all that stuff. And then I'm going to really start seeing what I can see. So th that would obviously be a very dumb thing. So that's a direct object reference to, to, to something by ID. So if at the server you, do, you have code like this, right? Classic GORM code, right? Credit card dot get, params ID, you know, uh, Grails is going to convert that string to a long, and and if that if there's a record with uh, in the database with that ID, that it's going to give you that credit card. It's way too easy. So one quick fix for that is instead of doing that, you know, well you shouldn't be showing it anything unless you're authenticated, right? So I can get the my either my user ID or my username very conveniently from the security implementation, and I can either get the user by ID. Um, or I can say user.find by username. E either way, whatever. Get the, you load that user. And now I can do a query that's a little bit more complex. Instead of saying get, which is basically find by ID, I can say find by ID and owner. So the SQL is going to go from select star from credit card where ID equals whatever, 42. It's going to change from that to select star from credit card where ID equals 42 and owner ID equals whatever my user ID is. This assumes that there's a one-to-many relationship between user and credit card, right? So, of course, the ID is going to match. But if I'm either not authenticated or if I'm authenticated as a different user, then, this, then that query is not going to match. And then that credit card doesn't come back. And then I can either return nothing or return an error or handle this much more intelligently than if I just did something really naive like this. So this is a really quick fix that you can put into your code. Um, that will filter, basically, credit cards by their owners. This is a little bit manual, and it would be nice if there were something more baked into Grails that, that did this. Um, there really isn't. Um, there is one thing you can do in Spring Security, which is to use the ACLs. Um, so you can, and this would usually be on one line, it wouldn't be quite so obnoxious. But if you have a, a secure, a, this would be in a controller, an annotated controller. This would have to use the Spring Security ACL plugin. And you would, when you create each credit card, you would grant the user who created it read permission on that, and probably edit too, right? But here we would say, if you have permission to read this ID, and it will actually in, uh, use reflection to get the current ID, and it'll go to the database for the ACL tables, and it'll see if there's a grant for that. And this is gonna create a proxy just like um, uh, in a transactional service, it'll create a proxy to start and stop a transaction. This will create a proxy that will intercept that method call. And if you, if you get a security violation, it won't run that code. So now credit card.get by ID is safe to run because the security check will have run and you'll have checked to see if you're the owner. Um, so that's reasonably easy to set up. Um, those tables, the ACL tables aren't aren't that uh, bad to set up, um, and this is safe. Another approach you can use is rather than actually putting the actual ID of the credit cards right into the HTML, you can use a, a placeholder, a, sort of a token, right? So HDIV, and I'm, I'm working on a, a plugin that will uh, add this to Grails, and uh, unfortunately, it will only be available for Spring for sorry for Grails two three and above, because um, the the HDIV team uh, sent in a pull request, a really big pull request, to change a lot of the Grails code. Uh, so it depends on a, on a fairly recent version of Spring, and it also depends on a new version of Grails. Um, so once uh, there's um, a version of two point three that isn't really um, unstable like it is right now that people can use, uh, I'll release that plugin so we can start playing with this. But this is a really powerful uh, library that does some amazing things. Um, so what it will do is it will basically replace the ID with anything. In, in this case, it's, it's a sequential number. So the zero doesn't mean anything. Zero is just a placeholder for, on the server side, the actual ID. 
So I can request view slash two, but there's no value stored under that key at the server, so that's not going to return anything. So I can't use my little script where I can just go from one to a billion, like, like before. I can only to do zero and one. Um, so I still have to use that intelligence at the server to only get the credit card if it's the one for the currently logged in user. Um, but um, this, gi <coughs> this gives me um, automatic um, protection from this. And the nice thing is that this is a standard Grails URL, right? So this is going to go to the card controller view action ID zero. But actually, HDIV is going to replace the zero. It's going to, it does a request uh, wrapper trick. So you actually see the number 42. So your code doesn't have to change. You'll actually get the, the actual, uh, the original um, value. So you have to use um, the tag libraries to generate the, the links. The tag libraries have been, uh, will be intercepted by HDIV to do this replacement, and then the request will be intercepted on the other end to do the re-replacement. Um, so it's really transparent to your code. Y your GSPs will be the same as long as you use the Grails tags and your controllers can be the same, and the, the framework just does all, all the work for you. So it's really seamless and, and really powerful. Um, coming to a Grails version soon. Um, we'll have time at the end for questions, but, and I'm going through this kind of quickly, but if you guys have any questions along the way, please. We, we started a little early, so we have a little extra time. Um, make sense so far? It's pretty straightforward stuff. Um, all right, so CSRF, um, very closely related to cross-site scripting. Um, in fact, it really almost entirely depends on XSS vulnerabilities. And in fact, if you fix your XSS vulnerabilities, you pretty much can't do CSRF. Um, so this will use cross-site scripting to inject code that will then make requests on your behalf. So I actually used this trick years ago, before Ajax, back in the 90s. Um, it turns out that if you put any valid URL inside of the source of an Im image tag, the browser will just do a get for that. It'll get, hopefully, a bunch of bytes back, and it'll hopefully, hopefully be a GIF or a JPEG or a ping or something. Um, and if it's garbage, if it's a JSON response, or if it's whatever, or if it's nothing, then you'll just get a little broken image icon, right? Um, but you can use that to send messages to a server. So I could, I could build a, a URL to my site with your JSession ID using a trick like this. Because you didn't use HTTP only true on your cookies, and I can read your cookies from JavaScript, and I can uh, send information without even using uh, Ajax. This is really, really simple stuff. Um, and uh, so if I set the image size to be one pixel, you won't even see a little damaged link, a damaged image. It'll be transparent. Uh, you won't even see it in the browser. Um, something more nefarious would be a link like that second link, where um, you uh, transfer money from one account to another. And this may seem contrived, but um, there's actually, I, I read a story about a guy who did this on a Bitcoin site. Uh, and he made a lot of money by stealing money from accounts, because what they were using you know how you're supposed to use uh, gets for getting information, but you want to use post when you're creating something or deleting something or updating something? I mean, that's sort of common sense. We all know that now. Well, apparently, uh, one of these Bitcoin sites had everything as, as gets. So deletes and transfers and, and changes were being done with gets as, as well as getting information. So you could create a get request that would actually... And I, the, the cool thing here is I don't even need to know what your account ID is because the server already knows. I just need to know what my account ID is. My account ID is one, two, three, and that's gonna transfer a thousand euros from your account to my account. You don't even have to click a link. You just have to load that page. When the page loads, the browser will, will uh, do a get for that request. And so every time you hit refresh, I get a thousand euros. So um, I'm in the wrong business, really. I should be doing this stuff. Born with a conscience, unfortunately. Um, so how do we fix this? How do we not allow this to happen on our sites? Um, fix cross-site scripting, right? So if you can inject those links into image tags inside of a comment, you can't make these requests on the user's behalf. So for the most part, if you fix cross-site scripting, um, 
using a, proper escaping and you know the stuff we talked about a few slides ago, then cross-site um, request uh, isn't going to happen. Um, one small thing that can help, but it doesn't fix it because I can always create a programmatic. I can always do a, a uh, AJAX post, but if you only use post for updates, it makes it a little bit harder. So you ha the hackers have to be slightly smarter. Um, the real fix, though, is a, a unique token for each link and for each form. And that's, again, where HDIV comes in. Um, because what it will do is, if you use the Grails tag libs to, to, for the input type equals hidden and the text fields and the checkboxes and everything, what it will do is it will use the data from every tag, from every bit of information inside of the, the page to, to add more data to, to a... Uh, to a either to a, uh, a hash or to an actual map of data. Um, and so it will put a unique string inside of your href links or as a hidden input inside of your forms. And then when you click that link, that will get uh, validated at the server, either from a link or from a form request. And it will decompose that, that string, and it's, you know, it's, it's going to be a random string. And it, it will look and it'll validate that you didn't change any data that shouldn't have been changed, like um, drop-down lists. You could, you could, one of the hacks you can do is you can add extra items to a drop-down list if you know uh, extra information. But in general, it will, it will check that what was sent down to you was what you sent back again. So if, for example, you know that you can get admin access by sending in an extra URL. You know, the, the sort of simple example is ampersand admin equals true, right? So uh, if that will allow you to validate that um, only the attributes that um, you allow were, s were sent down and came back again. W again, and this requires no changes on your part. All you have to do is make sure you don't write, um, you have to use all the Grails tags. You have to use the gform and gInput uh, text and input hidden and gselect. All, if you just use the g colon tags, all the regular uh, tags, then all that data will get included in the link and then it'll get validated for you at the, at the end and you'll get a, um, you get a regular uh, GORM validation error. Just like if you had a blank string or a, if the, your e email was invalid or anything like that, you'll, get a, you'll, you'll actually get a, a uh, validation error that you can then check for and uh, display an error. So this will all be documented in the HDIV plugin um, and that will be the link. It's not live yet, but it will, it will be. So that's CSRF. So like I said, security misconfiguration, well, this, um, th things like um, security misconfiguration and URL guarding uh, being broken are actually pretty far down the list. Because if you have misconfigured security, either at the application server or in your code, you know, this can really open up some very serious uh, opportunities for hackers to, to do bad things. But it's only, it's, it's far down on the list because it's reasonably easy to do. You just do the right thing, right? So um, uh, you just need to be uh, smart about uh, your hardware and your software. So make sure you have the latest um, security patches for your operating system. Make sure whatever ser servers you're using, Tomcat, TC Server, WebLogic, WebSphere, whatever, um, when they announce a security vulnerability, you fix it and patch it, right? So those are relatively easy to do. Also, do stuff like um, if there's a default password on the software, don't use that default password. Um, MySQL comes with a test user and a test database, right? You can't do anything as that user, but just delete the database and delete the user because you, you're not going to use it. And there is a possibility in the future that maybe someone could find some sort of a vul vulnerability there. So the, the phrase that they use is you want to reduce the attack surface. So the, more, the less things that are running, the less ports that are open, the less software that's running, the less features that are available for all your software, um, the less likely it is that you know, there's an opportunity for someone to get in there and, and do something. Um, yes. All right. Um, what 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 time do I go to? How much time do I have left? I think I'm running out of time, right? I go till twelve or one, twelve thirty. Fifteen minutes. Okay, thanks. Um, 
It's secure cryptographic storage. So um, just really quickly, um, there's hashing and encrypting. They're very different. So hashing is what you do with passwords. It's one way. Um, encrypting is, is uh, changing. It's basically creating a hash, but it's, it's decryptable. So hashing is, is lossy, but that's fine because what you do is you don't decrypt the password from the database to see if it's the same as the clear text password that you're logging in as. You re, you re encrypt the new clear text password and see if they're the same. Um, so we want to make sure that you do smart um, hashing and encryption. So don't use MD5 or SHA-1 because they're so easy to do that there are actually databases online where you can look up um, passwords. You can't decrypt the SHA-1 or the MD5, but you can actually create a database of millions of encrypted passwords and just look them up and figure out what the, what the password was. Um, so you want to use the SALT or even better, use bcrypt. Um, the, I'm, I'm working currently on a uh, kind of a rewrite of the Spring Security plugin, because right now it's got a lot of stuff that I've maintained for backwards compatibility reasons, so I'm gonna break a lot of backwards compatibility and change it so it's much more aggressively um, secure by default. Um, and one of the things it's, it's gonna do is it's gonna use bcrypt by default, so you're gonna have to, you can change it back, but by default it's gonna be more secure. Um, Bcrypt is nice because uh, you can slow it down. So you can use a large number of iterations and it will take longer to pre-compute um, those lookups because if it takes a second to, um, for the password check to happen, then you can't do a brute force attack very efficiently because you know, it's, it's gonna be really slow. Um, so um, use smart approaches to doing data encryption when you're actually doing encryption that's gonna be decryptable. For example, if you're storing credit cards or any personal data that has to be encrypted, um, there are great options available to you. Bonsi Castle, Jasipt. Um, there's a, a maintained plugin for, for Jasipt, um, for, for Grails. Um, so, and that gives you really easy access to really, really high level complex algorithms that I, I don't understand and, and I don't wanna to have to learn, I don't wanna to have to become a security expert in order to know how to encrypt data. I just want something to do it for me and this will apply a whole bunch of best practices for you, so, so use that. Um, yeah, again, just do smart things. You know, don't store passwords in text files on the file system and uh, rotate your keys, things like that. <laughs> so failure to restrict URL access. This is the one, the example I, I gave at the, at the top. It's, uh, this is an easily solved problem. Just use a security framework, right? Um, very, very simple to, to block access to the admin section of your app to users who have the, role, the admin role. Very easy to block access to your personal information to only be viewable by, by you using ACLs or roles or, or whatever. Um, so it would be bad if, if, if you broke that, but it's, easy to, it's an easy problem to solve. Um, and a setting that I strongly recommend that you use is reject if no rule true. So this is nice because what it does is um, the current assumption of the plugin, the Spring Security plugin, is that you have most of your site is open, but some of it is guarded, right? So there's an admin section or there's your personal uh, purchase history, things like that. Um, this this um, configuration setting assumes just the opposite, that everything is locked down, but you have to open things up. So what happens is in the first scenario, if I create a new guarded section of the site or a new page or a new URL and I forget to annotate it or forget to add it to my list of, of you know, uh, actions to block, then I open up a, a security hole. This says, if, there's no, if it doesn't say anything about who can access it, then no one can access it. So that'll fail early and you'll get complaints from users saying, I'm logged in as an admin, but I can't get to this, this new admin page. What's going on? And so then I just, all right, I'm sorry, I'll add the annotation or I'll add the request map in the database or whatever. So this is the, really the safest way to go. It requires a little bit more setup up front, but um, it, it's uh, really the, the safest thing to do. That will be the default in the new plugin. Again, you can turn that off, but you shouldn't. Um, Yeah, and, and one, one thing I wanted to mention is that this is easy to test, and I'm gonna talk about testing in my talk later this afternoon about security testing. Um, and you need a good sitemap, and I have a, I'll show you a, a very small um,
block of code where it'll, it can find every uh, action in every controller in your application. Not every URL, but every action. So it can give you a list of stuff that you uh, need to test. Um, and you just ignore, the, you, don't, you don't need to security test your login page because you know, you know that works. Um, but you can find what, uh, quickly what, what's available to test. Um, insufficient transport layer protection is basically, says use SSL. Um, you can easily in, this, in Spring Security plugin configure which URLs use SSL and which ones don't and which ones can't. Um, your best bet is to just use SSL for your entire site. You get some tricky problems because if you authenticate using SSL, which is a good idea, right? Um, that secure cookie cannot be used in, in an insecure way. So you've got to use these weird hacks, like you've got to make a copy of your login cookie, which was secure, and make, it a, make a copy of it, which isn't secure, in order that it be visible to the rest of your site. And that kind of defeats the purpose of using SSL to log in. So you would never want to submit um, a password in clear text without SSL. Um, so since you're going to have SSL for your login anyway, you might as well use it for the whole site. And it used to be the case that it would really slow you down and you really kind of needed hardware um, um, to, 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 uh, to, because you, you, you've got to encrypt every page, right? SSL basically just uses encryption for all the, all the transport. Uh, but hardware is fast enough that I, th I think the, the cost of SSL is, the performance cost of SSL is, is low enough that it's, it's worth it to just use it across the site. Um, and then best practices, uh, you know, don't buy cheap certificates from bobsssl.com, um, you know, actually buy, or bertssssl.com. Um, use a large key size, rotate your keys, uh, renew the certificates as you need to, all that stuff. Um, and you can even do extreme stuff like um, you can use the SSL between your web server and your database if you use um, MySQL, and I assume other databases support that. It's a little much. Um, but it is an option. And then this is a, the last of these, um, blindly redirecting or forwarding to another site. You know, it's, it's something that anyone can take advantage of. Um, so if, if you have a URL which expects that you're going to be given a, a URL to redirect to and it doesn't check it, it doesn't check that it's local within the site, um, then you could theoretically uh, build a URL Again, using a, an XSS attack um, that would redirect the user from your from the from your website to my website, and if I've done it well, I could even skin it so that it looks like your website. So you'd think I'm on your website. Now you're in my server. Now my rules apply. I could capture some information, um, do something silly like um, give you a login page saying, "Please reauthenticate," because, for example, you go to Amazon. You don't have to log in, but it knows who you are because you've got a cookie and you've got recommendations. But then when you go to purchase something, it'll say, you need to authenticate. So people have been trained that at some point during your workflow, you may have to authenticate again. Um, so if suddenly I ask you to authenticate, now you're giving me your password. And then at some point when I'm done messing with you, then I send you back to the original site because I know where you came from, from the referrer header or because I hacked you. So if you allow me to, if, if you allow me to redirect you to my site, then really, really bad things can happen. So don't use um, naive URLs like this. Check that it's relative um, so that you can't do a, an absolute URL to another site. You could also do things like using um, placeholders. So instead of next page equals a URL, you could say, you know, you could, you could sort of obfuscate it a little bit, but use a code there. So A2 is actually a placeholder for some relative URL within your application. So you don't, you don't allow any input. You just have a s fixed set of strings that, that are next pages. Uh, so some links. Um, the SAPI API is a really good one there. Um, there is a Grails plugin for that, um, the XSS Sanitizer plugin. Um, that has a whole bunch of methods for escaping and encoding text data. Um, this will be a part of the Spring Security Core 2.0 plugin. Um, and you can use it right now with the XSS Sanitizer plugin. I didn't write that, so I don't know if it's maintained uh, or if it's outdated. Uh, has these really convenient methods like that, um, all sorts of encoding methods. Anti-SAMI is another one that's similar, but it's more for um, HTML. 
and it'll actually strip out HTML and it has a policy file configuration setup. Um, there's currently a sanitizer plugin that does that. Again, it's not mine, so I don't know um, much about it. But again, that will be an option in, in Spring Security Core 2.0, which is on my long list of stuff that I got to do soon. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, there's the HDIV plugin, um, which is mostly done. It's just I'm waiting for it to there to be a Grails version that you can actually use it in. Um, so as soon as there's a, a uh, beta of 2.3 or a release candidate, then I'll, I'll release that plugin and you guys can play with that. Um, yeah, it depends on this, this interface. It's in Spring MVC 3.1, um, the request data value processor. So that's the thing that does the, that interception, so replacing the placeholders and doing, creating the, the uh, CSRF uh, hashes and things like that. Um, I didn't know where to put these two images, so I just put them at the end. Um, so this is a eating your own dog food presentation. This was a Griffin app running this whole time. Um, there's a Slideware plugin that um, is, is pretty cool. And I, I have, I've been taking some notes. I'm gonna do a blog post on doing presentations not with uh, Keynote or with um, PowerPoint, but using Griffin. We're groovy programmers. We should be using groovy for everything, right? So, um, so uh, a couple minutes left. Questions? <laughs> Um, so um, this is how to find me. Um, I have a book coming out soon. Should be out next month. Um, I hope in March, maybe April. You can get the early access now. Thank you. <laughs>